I share my screen. So just bear with me while I do that. Okay. Great. Okay, here we go. So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, as Gillian said, uh, my name is Ellie and I work in the English department at Nottingham Trent University. And uh, in my research, I look at domestic magazines from the first half of the 20th century and I'm currently working on a book all about Women's Weekly. Now, as I'm sure a lot of you will know, uh, Women's Weekly has always been famed for its knitting. Uh, famed for its knitting was the magazine's uh, tagline, its strapline during, uh, during the 1960s. And when I was researching the magazine, I found myself writing a lot about its knitting patterns. Now, as Gillian said, I'm a very keen knitter myself. Um, I've knitted most of my life. And so I thought looking at these patterns was absolutely brilliant. And I decided to extend my research by looking at knitting patterns in other domestic magazines as well, see how they compared to those which I was looking at in Women's Weekly. And so what I'm going to share with you today is um, are some patterns uh, in, the, in the Knitting and Crochet Guild's collection of interwar domestic magazines uh, where I did some research a year or so ago. Hang on, I can't make my slides move. There we are. Okay, um, so here's what my talk today is going to cover. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing uh, the Knitting and Crochet Guild's wonderful collection um, because I think it's really important that we kind of understand the materials that we're working with. Um, and then I'm going to use these magazines to talk about how fashions in knitwear developed between the First and the Second World Wars. Now, during the interwar decades, domestic magazines published a huge range of knitting patterns, uh, which included clothing for women, men, children and babies, um, knitted toys and items for the home, such as blankets and table mats and edgings for household linen. And the collection contains some absolutely wonderful examples of all of these. But as our time today is quite limited, um, I'm going to focus just on patterns for women's clothing as these account for the vast majority of patterns in the collection. Now, throughout my talk, I'm going to be sharing some images from the Knitting and Crochet Guild's wonderful collection. And I'd just like to say now how incredibly grateful I am to the Guild for giving me permission to share them with you. Usually patterns in the collection are accessible only to Guild members, so being allowed to share them with an audience outside the Guild um, is incredibly special and I just want to say a big thank you for the Guild uh, for allowing me to do that. Now I'm hoping that these images will inspire those of you who are knitters to want to try out some of these patterns for yourselves. And so again, with the Guild's permission, I've put together a booklet that will give you a little flavour of what they're like to work with. And I'm going to talk about more about how you can uh, get this booklet and how you can share what you've been knitting um, at the end of my talk. Okay, so just to introduce the Knitting and Crochet Guild quickly first. Um, the Guild is a UK-based, uh, volunteer-run, national educational charity that's dedicated to the study and the practice of knitting and crochet, uh, including machine knitting. Uh, the Knitting and Crochet Guild amalgamated with the Guild of Machine Knitters not so long ago. Its collection of knitting and crochet related items is the UK's largest and it is housed in Britannia Mills in Slathwaite on the edge of Huddersfield in Yorkshire. And the ra rather blurry photo that you can see on the slide there is of Britannia Mills itself. The collection is housed in the top story of this old mill building and uh, it's a really wonderful place to go and work those big windows with beautiful views of the surrounding town and the countryside as well it's it's really lovely up there so the guild's collection is a real treasure trove for anybody who is interested in knitting and crochet <laughs> 
containing over 2,000 made items, 50,000 patterns, including the fantastic Patents Pattern Archive, and hundreds of artefacts. It is an incredible repository of material relating to both crafts, both knitting and crochet. This photograph on this slide shows where the patterns are stored and uh, the, the bookshelf uh, on the, the far left hand side there um, is where the Guild's wonderful collection of knitting and crochet related books, um, its library is held and that's again really well worth looking at. It's a great place to spend an afternoon. But our focus today is the Guild's collection of domestic magazines from the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, the two decades between the First and the Second World Wars. This collection includes complete magazines, magazine supplements, so the free knitting and crochet supplements that were given away with the magazines, and tear-outs. Um, tear-outs are the patterns torn out of the magazines and supplements and kept by their readers comprising 260 magazines representing 44 different titles. This collection represents magazine readers of a range of ages and from a range of backgrounds. So for instance, um, upmarket magazine, The Lady, targets uh, quite well-off women. Uh, the Girls' Own Paper and Women's Magazine targets young, mostly unmarried, middle-class girls and cheap weeklies like Home Chat, which is pictured here, target women on relatively low incomes. And so as a whole, together, the collection tells us that knitting was very, very popular with all sorts of domestic magazine readers from a wide range of social backgrounds uh, between the two world wars. Now, like most items in the Guild's collection, these magazines were donated. Um, we think they were probably donated by Guild members, um, but as donor records were never actually kept, we really don't know this for certain. They do, however, yield tantalising clues to their original readers' identities. Um, children's scribbles, like this wonderful picture of a house that you can see on this slide, um, show that some magazines belong to mothers or grandmothers, uh, one reader notes in the margin of one of the patterns that she would like it to be knitted for her birthday, um, which suggests that some of these patterns were collected by people who didn't knit uh, with a view to asking their friends uh, to knit things for them. Crossings out and sizing notes show that some of the patterns were made, but others' pristine condition suggests that they were put by for the future, they were kept very carefully, but they were never made. So giving tiny glimpses into their original readers' lives and knitting practices, these annotations offer really fascinating insights into who used these patterns and how they used them. So knitting patterns were a well-established feature of women's magazines by the start of the 20th century and titles launched before 1920, such as My Weekly, which was launched in 1910, and Women's Weekly, which was um, launched a year later in 1911, published them from the outset. And here is a photograph of Women's Weekly's first ever knitting pattern, which is uh, for a pair of bed socks for either a gentleman or a lady. Now, during the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, the popularity of knitting and knitwear absolutely soared. Both became incredibly popular. And there was also a, bo a boom in domestic magazine publishing and new titles uh, such as Good Housekeeping, which was launched in 1922, uh, Woman's Own and Woman, both of which were launched during the, uh, the 1930s. They all featured knitting patterns. So knitting has been integral to these domestic magazines ever since they were first brought out. Now these knitting patterns performed a lot of very important functions uh, for their host magazines. They gave extra value for money when you bought your magazine which was relatively cheap you got several knitting patterns in it as well uh, and they also helped their readers to develop new skills, wear the newest fashions and work to produce things that would last unlike housework, which was of course supported elsewhere in these magazines in their domestic advice columns. And I think this last point is, uh, this last point, sorry, is really, really important. Um, you know, you have to do the washing up 
multiple times a day. You have to do your laundry every week. But when you knit something, it stays finished. Your family isn't going to come and unravel it for you. So you end up having to start it all over again. And for me, this is what really distinguishes knitting from the other types of domestic work, which are supported by these domestic magazines. And maybe that really contributed to its popularity amongst their readers. Now, knitting also gave magazine readers important me time, uh, time away from their work and their families, time to themselves. And uh, it also provided magazines with very important advertising income, which helped to keep their cover prices low. Promoted on knitting, uh, sorry, promoted on front covers where they caught the eye of women browsing newsagent shelves. Uh, patterns were a key selling point of domestic magazines. And I think this home companion front cover is a brilliant example of this. You can see it's, it's, it's sort of dominated by this image of a woman modeling the latest sweater. There's another sweater as well. Um, inside, there are more new designs. At the top of the magazine, uh, you can see there. Uh, the supplement of knitted jumpers this week. Um, so you've got three even more patterns. Um, and so it's really kind of calling out uh, to women, to keen knitters who are kind of browsing the shelves of their, of their local news agent and using knitting as a reason uh, to buy the magazine. Now, before I talk about knitting patterns in magazines from the 1920s and the 1930s, I want to turn back briefly to magazines from the 1910s, which is when many of the developments that took place during the interwar years really started to take hold. In the Guild's collection of magazines issued between 1910 and 1919, crochet patterns significantly outnumber knitting patterns. And this tells us that during this decade, domestic magazine readers actually much preferred, knit, uh, sorry, much preferred crochet to knitting. This is a hangover from the 19th century. Queen Victoria herself was an enormous fan of crochet. She crocheted copiously and women crocheted to copy her and they made fancy trimmings and accessories to decorate their homes and their clothing. This slide uh, shows an example of some fancy work crochet patterns from the 1910s, which were issued in Home Companion in December 1915. And as you can see from the photographs of the patterns, uh, they are both for crocheted tablecloth edging, so they make your tea tablecloth look very pretty. Requiring just a crochet hook and some thread to make, patterns like this were relatively cheap to make and they gave magazine readers on low incomes in particular a very affordable way of decorating their homes and their clothing. So I like to think about the of these uh, these early well these early 20th century crochet patterns as a form of very affordable luxury which meant that women on low incomes could make pretty things without having to spend too much money. Uh, here's another lovely example of uh, a crochet pattern from the 1910s. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, crocheted evening bag or an opera bag uh, from Home Companion 1913. Um, and if you look closely at the design, um, you'll see it's this beautiful sailing ship in full sail. Um, and there are two stars either side of the mast in the top left and the top right hand corners of the of the panel there. And it's got some beautiful uh, floaty tassels underneath. And so this is a lovely example of one of those kind of uh, very fancy accessories, um, a piece of affordable luxury that, that women could make for themselves quite cheaply. Now, in contrast to crochet, knitting was very much a functional craft during the 1910s. It was used to produce mostly practical garments like socks and stockings and shawls and petticoats, warm clothing for babies and children. And um, this slide uh, shows a hat for a small boy, which was printed in Home Companion uh, during 1912. And here is a child's coat, uh, also printed in Home Companion. It's called a useful little jacket in its caption. Here are some knitted gloves. Um, these appeared in the girls' own paper um, in 1915. Uh, the, the captions are very tiny, so I'll read them for you. The, the, the glove on the left is called a lady's glove with a gauntlet, so it would have uh, kept your wrist nice and warm. And the, the glove on the right uh, is a baby's knitting with a pretty bow on it. <laughs> 
So during the 1910s, crochet was much more popular than knitting, and knitting was very much a functional craft used mostly to produce garments that would keep people warm. There are signs of change, however. In around 1909, knitted outerwear for women began to enter mainstream fashion with the introduction of the sports coat, a garment like a very heavy cardigan, which had originally been worn for playing golf. Um, and here are a couple of examples. So here is a girl's own magazine sports coat, a heavy cardigan. Um, and here's another version. This is in uh, the Home Companion from 1912. Um, now, as you can see, uh, this Home Companion version is actually crocheted rather than knitted, um, but it's a very similar shape to the girl, girl's own sports coat. Um, and it also has pockets. So it's clear that they're two, um, you know, that they're two different versions of the same garment. Uh, that was that was beginning to become fashionable in those days. Now, Women's Weekly um, also pr printed a pattern for a sports coat, and sadly, I don't have a picture of this um, because I couldn't visit the uh, couldn't visit the collection during lockdown. Um, but the magazine called it the pattern of Queen Mary's hand knitted coat, and printed it alongside a photograph of the Queen herself modelling hers. Now, emphasising that the coat is hand-knitted and drawing readers' attention to its royal model, Women's Weekly's pattern um, signalled very clearly that knitted outerwear, the sports coat, had become fashionable in the very highest circles. And so knitting and knitwear were gaining popularity before the start of the 1920s, and domestic magazines were urging their readers to take part in these, these new trends, so were they really kind of helping to push this new popularity of both the handicraft and the garments that it was being used to make? Now, the First World War was another really important factor in hand knitting's rising popularity. Um, from the war's outbreak in the summer of 1914, a huge volunteer army needed kitting out, and knitters responded with a lot of enthusiasm, churning out socks and balaclavas and mufflers and other comforts that helped to mitigate the harsh conditions of trench and naval warfare. Knitting expressed patriotism, it showed love and support for service personnel and it soothed personal anxiety. You could uh, knit to keep your hands and your mind busy while you're waiting for news of your loved ones at the front. And so the craft quickly became a national mania and it was taken up by people of all ages and all classes and all genders. Uh, domestic magazines did their bit as well by printing patterns for service knitwear. And this slide uh, shows a sock pattern from Home Notes uh, 1918. You can see it was published, well, it was issued in the, uh, uh, on, on 5th of October, so just over a month before the, the war actually finished. Um, but if you look, the two little figures um, on either side, of the, uh, either side of the title there are little cherubs and they're holding boxes sort of bound with paper and tied up with string. And on the boxes are little labels that say to Tommy. Um, so those boxes are obviously full of socks, full of knitted comforts, and they're being sent to Tommy to the British soldiers at the front. And just quickly, um, if you want to read any more about um, knitting uh, during the First World War, knitting for the troops, I can thoroughly recommend Lucinda Gosling's um, excellent book. It's called Knitting for Tommy, and it's got loads of really brilliant um, illustrations in it, lots of illustrations of the knitwear and the patterns that we use to make it. So I can thoroughly recommend that. Uh, knitting for Tommy by Lucinda Gosling. So by the 1920s, knitting was popular and knitwear was very fashionable. Although domestic magazines continued printing magazine, uh, sorry, printing patterns for decorative crochet throughout that decade, there was a marked rise in the number of patterns for women's outerwear and particularly for women's sweaters. Now, sweaters had been worn increasingly by women from the late 19th century when, in line with their growing emancipation, they participated increasingly in sports. But it was really during the 1920s that the so-called sweater craze really took off. Um, and this slide shows a lovely example from Women's Weekly from 1924. Here's another example of a sweater. Uh, this is from the girls' own paper from 1921. Now, as you can see, these sweaters were tubular in shape. Uh, they skimmed the figure to produce the straight up and down silhouette that we nowadays associate very strongly with the flapper fashions of the 1920s. Uh, bold and colourful designs like the checkered edging on this People's Friends sweater uh, invoked the jazz age. 
Um, although there also remained a trend for more elaborate lacy designs, uh, such as this woman's weekly model. Um, for me, these lacy patterns are a kind of compromise between the brand new um, tubular sweater um, and, and the kind of the older uh, crochet lace patterns, which the magazines would have been printing um, before the start of the 1920s. So sweaters were flexible, they were modest and they were comfortable. And as such, they were embraced by athletic, fashion conscious young women who found them so ideal uh, for activities such as driving and dancing and sport. Um, and I think this modern weekly uh, front cover really kind of highlights that. It's beautiful. It's this pattern for a striped jumper, which is promoted by pictures of people playing golf and driving cars. And um, I think it's such a great image of that kind of sporty, modern looking young woman in her flexible, comfortable knitwear that she could use for participating on, in all these activities which were now becoming available to her. Now, just before moving into the 1930s, um, I want to show you my favourite 1920s sweater pattern. Um, it's a chic jumper in a new Egyptian design and it appeared in Woman's Weekly. It's my favourite uh, from 1923. Now, the pattern suggested knitting it in uh, olive green and black. Uh, the colour work band around the bottom features a fabulous pattern of camels, pyramids, palm trees and flying birds. So it's sort of very Egyptian looking. Um, and it has a really interesting backstory. Uh, nine months before it was published, uh, King Tutankhamun's tomb had been discovered in the Valley of the Kings near Luxor in Egypt. And this discovery, discovery was huge. It was showcased by the global press. Pictures of the treasures from the tomb were appearing in all these um, newspapers and magazines around the world. And this triggered a huge vogue for Egyptian culture. And this sweater is really part of that vogue. By knitting and wearing it, Women's Weekly readers could express their enthusiasm for Egypt and participate in what was a really up to the minute trend. Um, and I love this sweater so much, I knitted it myself. Um, here's my version of it. I chose to write, uh, do it in red and um, chocolate brown instead of olive green and black. Now, during the 1930s, uh, knitwear remained a very practical, comfortable clothing choice for women um, at home and at work. Uh, sweaters were now a wardrobe staple and their popularity continued to rise. Uh, the Guild's domestic magazine collection contains over 300 sweater patterns from the 1930s. Sweaters account for over half of the women's wear patterns for that decades, which shows just how popular they were with domestic magazine readers. And as this modern weekly front cover shows, uh, sweaters were now fitted rather than tubular. Uh, this followed a trend in wider fas fashion for a more curvy, typically feminine in inverted commas, shape. And another thing this, uh, this cover draws our attention to is that many 1930 sweaters are characterised by statement features which really help to accentuate their wearers' figures. Um, for instance, these elaborate collars really kind of emphasise the shape of the shoulders. Now, the pattern advertised on this front cover is actually quite unusual, as it is for three sweaters in one. And I just want to show you part of the pattern now. OK, here we are. This is a three way jumper. Uh, what you do is you knit a plain sweater and then you can change it around by adding different collars and cuffs. So the sweater's on the left um, with a boat shaped collar and then there are two uh, sets of collars and cuffs are shown on the right. Um, and the set which is scalloped with small holes in the centre is worked in crochet and the pattern suggests adding it to your sweater on very special occasions. So it's seen as a way of dressing up the garment. So you might wear your boat shaped collar during the day and then if you've got a date or if you're having people over for a party you might put your crocheted um, your crocheted scallops on to kind of jazz up your outfit. Uh, here's another great example of a statement collar. Uh, this dainty ruffle on a sweater from Women's Pictorial in 1937. Um, and as you can see, this sweater also ex accentuates its wearer's figure with the belted waist and the exaggerated shoulders. And I love this pattern in particular because um, of, the, of the haughty and superior expression on its model's face. I think she looks so fabulous. I love it. Um, other statement features of 1930s sweaters include cravats. Um, this one is knitted in a very simple garter stitch and fastened with a kilt pin. 
Um, also lots of bows, uh, bows at the neck were very popular, lots of those in the collection. Puff sleeves as well, um, which would again sort of accentuate your shoulders and broaden you out at the top. Uh, and also large buttons, there was quite a vogue for large buttons uh, during the 30s. Uh, and there was also a trend um, for soft um, and again inverted commas feminine textures which would be produced by techniques including lace work, open work and cabling um, and we have a lovely um, example here this sweater in women's pictorial uh, with its beautiful open wear diamonds on the on the torso and the sleeves and those very graceful flowing sleeves it's got a lovely kind of soft softness to that fabric um, and here's another great example of some um, of an open work design from the from the 30s. Um, this was from the Sunday Tick Pictorial Knitting Book from 1936. And I think these uh, open work maple leaves are absolutely beautiful. This pattern is definitely on my list of patterns to make in the future. And uh, this, the, the, the sweater with the cravat that we looked at just now um, has a lovely pattern of cables. And again, those cables really kind of soften uh, the texture of the knitted fabric. Now, incidentally, it's really common for knitting patterns in 1930s magazines to show close-ups of interesting stitch patterns like this one. Um, next to the sh uh, photo uh, showing the completed garments, they often include a photo showing the stitch pattern uh, itself in a lot of detail. And this is really significant um, as it emphasizes that the women targeted by these patterns um, are not just connoisseurs of fashion, um, they're skilled makers who are fascinated by how, by how the patterns are constructed and really keen to learn new techniques. Um, these magazine readers are thought to enjoy the process of knitting as well as its outcome. To them, part of the joy of knitting is in making something as well as in wearing it once it's finished. Um, and this is definitely something that I identify with. Um, Although I love wearing clothes that I've knitted, I love knitting itself. And I think this is really brought home by these little close ups of stitch patterns, um, which I think really encourage readers to look closely at and really appreciate how these garments are constructed. Now, running a home on a limited budget was a very important focus of many interwar magazines and knitting pages blended economy with high fashion, um, especially during the 1930s when many of their readers were very badly affected by the Great Depression. Hollywood films offered escapism and Hollywood stars emerged as the new trendsetters. Uh, here is film star Deanna Durbin modeling an Angora sweater in Home Notes from 1939. Um, all the bright young things are in Hollywood are wearing fluffy Angora jumpers since Deanna Durbin started the fashion, uh, declares the pattern. Now this pattern really encapsulates the idea of handlets as affordable fashion. Uh, Durbin's expensive appearance contrasts very strongly with the cheap paper on which her photograph is printed, and yet her Angora sweater brings her glamour within reach of the women on very low incomes who were targeted by uh, home notes. Her uh, home notes only cost tuppence, so it was very cheap to buy indeed. For the price of a few balls of yarn, uh, these readers could wear a sweater just like the film stars. They can capture some of her glamour and have it themselves in their own lives. Now, 1930s knitwear also re uh, reflected a growing craze for sport and health and fitness. Um, and so, for instance, Wife and Home magazine uh, dressed its readers for the tennis court in this lovely little tennis pullover with its uh, green and white checkered squares on the top right hand side of the of the paper of the, of the page there um, and my weekly uh, prepared its readers for a whole range of outdoor activities uh, declaring of this sweater this polo neck sweater um, that if you play games or watch games go for country walks or drive a sports car here is your jumper so it's this fabulous kind of all-purpose outdoor activity garment um, and again a lovely example of this kind of close-up of the stitch pattern which invites readers to really kind of appreciate uh, the construction of the garment and how they would make it themselves. Now symbolising healthy outdoor lifestyles, suntans came into vogue during the 1930s and they sparked a huge craze for sunsuits and bathing costumes which allowed women to expose more flesh in public than had previously been considered decent. 
Uh, flexible and clinging knitted fabrics were ideal for these garments and patterns, uh, magazine patterns for homemade versions became very, very popular with young working women in particular who couldn't afford to buy ready-made versions from the shops, they were too expensive. This pattern is from Woman's Way in 1933. Um, it's published in June. Uh, it's modelled next to the sea, or at least it's modelled next to a picture of the sea. Um, and it encourages readers to anticipate their summer holidays with a lot of pleasure. The reality of wearing these garments was often, however, much less than pleasurable because they collected sand and they sagged when they became waterlogged. And uh, Emmy Sale, a wonderful dress historian, um, is uh, thinks that given these issues, it's likely that many uh, of these bathing costumes uh, would have been worn for sunbathing rather than swimming. And she points out that often they are modelled by women wearing shoes, which suggests that they're not about to go and leap into the sea wearing their swimming costumes. Now, during the winter months, uh, domestic magazines printed patterns for knitted underwear, uh, vests and knickers that promised to keep their readers warm in uncentrally heated homes. And again, uh, these stretchy, clinging, knitted fabric would be ideal for these garments, which, like swimming costumes, were designed to be figure hugging. Um, here is an example from Women's Way. And here's another lovely example. This is from an unknown magazine. I'm not sure where this was torn out of. Um, but this pattern tells readers that these woolies will solve the problem of how to keep warm this winter and still look slim. And I presume that what it means by that is that by wearing woolen underwear, um, you would reduce the need for lots of bulky layering. And so you wouldn't need to put on lots of clothes to keep yourself warm in your uncentrally heated home. Now, I want to finish this presentation by sharing one of the most striking patterns from the collection. Um, it's this wonderful skating outfit, which appeared in Home Notes uh, in November 1936. Now, this pattern appeared in a Home Notes winter knitting supplement, and it consists of a matching sweater, skirt, gloves and beret, all knitted in very fine four ply wool on very narrow, uh, very slender needles. Um, so. I think the chances of anyone knitting the entire thing um, between November when it came out and the end of the skating season are probably fairly low. Um, but it's, you know, it's nice to have something to aspire to anyway. Now, this pattern um, is really important because it really illustrates just how far knitwear has come in the period that we've looked at today. Um, by presenting this skating outfit as the season's smartest, the pattern positions the garment at the very forefront of winter fashion. And in doing so, it really emphasizes that in just 30 years, hand knitting and knitwear have risen from something being something that is largely functional, um, a means of providing warmth and comfort to being a key part of a fashionable woman's wardrobe, something that you might wear uh, make and wear to keep up with the latest trends. And uh, as the patterns that we've seen today show, uh, knitwear's rise in popularity during the 1920s and the 1930s is fueled largely by domestic magazines, which by publishing these patterns, advertising them on their front covers, and also publishing those free knitting supplements, were really seeking to attract and also create readerships of um, skilled and enthusiastic knitters. So there you are, that's my talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, and now I'd love to hear any questions or thoughts you have. So Julian, let me stop sharing my screen. Julian, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. That was fascinating. Um, so knitted swimsuit, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, there are lots and lots of questions. So we'll try and get through them. Um, so the first one is from Marlene, and she wants to know, do companies like Pattern, P-A-T-O-N-S, have a library of their patterns? Um, well, the Patents Pattern Archive um, is actually held by the Knitting and Crochet Guild, um, so that's in the Knitting and Crochet Guild's collection. Um, and I'm not sure about the other pattern. Uh, I'm not sure about the other pattern uh, companies, but I do know that Patents are in uh, are in Slackaway in the Guild's collection. Okay. Um, the next one is from Cashman Kerr Prince. 
Was Angora a luxury fibre in the 1930s? One of how affordable the, um, <coughs> the Aya Durban pullover would have been then. That's a really great question. Um, I, and I'm actually not so sure about, I, I can't really answer that. Um, I have looked, I've been trying to find um, uh, uh, like price lists of uh, how much balls of knitting uh, yarn would have cost back then. Um, and I haven't managed to track any down yet. So if anyone has any ideas about where I could have got them, uh, I, could, I could find some of those. I'd be really interested to know. Okay, the next one is from Becca. What was the availability of yarn fibre like? Would there have been, um, how, how would they have purchased their yarn? Uh, well, they'd probably gone um, to, uh, I think probably would have been sold in draper's shops. Um, and I also know anecdotally um, that you might not necessarily buy all the yarn that you needed all at once to make a sweater, particularly a large garment, that would have been quite expensive to make. So what you do is you'd ask the uh, shopkeeper to put aside for you the amount that you needed, but then you'd go back each week or each month and buy a little more until you'd... Um, until you'd finished making the pattern. Um, so although knitwear was obviously, it was more, um, it was more, it was less expensive than shop, a lot of shop bought clothing. It was still, you know, it still needed a bit of an outlay um, by the knitters. Okay. The next one is from Valhi. So in the 1920s and 30s, newspapers frequently published books of advice and instruction on how to run a home. Did women's magazines produce compilations of patterns on how to or how to books um well i mean they uh in terms of knitting um they certainly um they certainly did sort of that you know as well as targeting um expert knitters they also published pattern tutorials um and some of the supplements in the collection are, are targeting uh, they, they 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 call themselves easy collections or easy knitting books so they're definitely targeting beginners as well as more experienced knitters um and they did they did also publish um sort of homemaking homemaking supplements there were lots of cookery supplements um dressmaking crochet um and they would have um there might be a spring cleaning special once a year or something which would sort of tell you how to kind of spring clean your home when you needed to. Okay, um, this is a question from the YouTube. Um, so were the knitted garments of the not 20s and 30s predominantly wool or were any made in cotton? Um, from the patterns that I've seen, um, when they, uh, you know, because the patterns um, by the 20s and 30s patterns usually recommended the brand of yarn. Um, that you would use. Um, pretty much all, yeah, all of the ones that I've seen are um, made out of wool. Um, there are a lot of crochet patterns, however, which would have been cotton. Um, so, but knitting patterns, uh, I've, I've only seen wool, I think. Okay. Um, there's a question about crochet, because crochet uses much more yarn, and the person was wondering if the movement moved away from crochet towards knitting because it was costs it's cost saving. Uh, that's a really interesting question. I, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Okay. Um, yeah, so what's another one about Angora? Was it a luxury fibre in the 1930s? Oh, no, I've done that one, haven't I? <laughs> oh, dear, there's lots of Okay, so how, this is a good interesting one from Andrew. From Andrew, how did the instructions in these patterns differ from instructions today? Some okay. older patterns seem very skimpy in their instructions, I've found. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the patterns, um, like back, back at the start of the, of the 20th century and sort of up to, up to the 1920s, the patterns, um, like you say, they did skimp on the instructions and they would assume a lot, they would assume that their knitter knew already to do a lot of things. So for instance, the woman's weekly sock pattern that I showed you, it's about sort of eight lines long. It's very, very simple indeed. Um, and uh, so yeah, they, they would, they'd leave out things, they'd, um, 
other things other things that were different um, so often well so nowadays um, a pattern will usually um, give measurements um, give different sizes as well so you can knit it for, for different sizes but back then um, it would give it you know it was it was rare for them to give measurements um, and they never gave different sizes so again they're assuming uh, that the knitter knows how to resize the garment uh, for herself um, and she'll know how to choose the materials and choose the, the needle size um, which would be appropriate for making that garment. Um, also, um, I think you may have, you probably noticed that the, the knitting patterns from the 1910s, uh, they tended to use drawings from the photographs. And again, you know, those drawings, they kind of give you an idea of vaguely what shape it should look like, but there are no kind of, you know, detailed information in there um, about the kind of construction. Um, and so, um, again, they're sort of, so these patterns are assuming expert knitters who basically know, um, you know, you know, they know what they're doing without needing to be told. Um, the First World War really changed all that. Um, as I said, they... Um, you know, the First World War triggered this, a, a big national craze for knitting and lots of people started knitting things for the first time ever. And the result was that you ended up with a lot of garments which were very misshapen um, and, uh, and not really useful for what they were supposed to be intended. There were sort of stories of soldiers using knitted socks to clean their guns because they're not useful for anything else. And as a result of that, patterns um, realized that they needed to become uh, more detailed, they needed to include you know more detailed instructions and um so from the sort of from the from the, the first world war the 1920s onwards patterns start, to start looking a lot more similar to how they look today and they begin to give these kind of step-by-step -step instructions that we would uh, we would expect in a pattern today okay um is there a similar fashion development in dressmaking um I'm not sure. Um, I know dressmaking was um, was a, a I, basically I haven't really looked at dressmaking in as much detail. I mean, it was, again, a really important part of the magazines and they would each week there'd be like a double page spread, certainly in Women's Weekly, um, of different um, dress patterns. Uh, they'd usually buy um, a, a dressmaking company called Bestway, which was owned by the Amalgamated Press, which uh, was, the, was, the, was the kind of publishing house that published Women's Weekly. So it's this kind of in-house fashion designer. Um, and so these, these, these dresses would be sort of displayed each week in the magazine. Uh, the magazine gave coupons away that you could use to buy the patterns. Um, but the other thing, I think the interesting thing about dressmaking in the domestic magazines is, again, um, there's a huge, a very, very high level of expertise um, is assumed by them. Um, you know, readers will write in to the dressmaking expert and say, I have a dress from like last season and I want to, here is a sketch of it and I want to update it for this season. And the dressmaking expert will write back, well, you know, you cut the sleeves off here and then you get some artificial silk and you sort of add a panel of this here and then take the pockets out and turn them into something else and then da, 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 da. and you know they give these very scant instructions um, without patterns without drawings um, which the readers are expected to follow so I think it's very clear that obviously not all readers but some readers would have been you know very very adept at dressmaking and could kind of you know just follow these very scant instructions to adapt their clothing um, yeah um, Lindsay wondered if there were any knitting publications aimed at male knitters during this period. Um, I haven't seen any. Um, that's a really interesting question. I haven't seen any. Um, that's not to say. And of course, you know, there's nothing to stop men um, knitting from domestic magazine patterns. I mean, I know that men read domestic magazines because they often write to the agony ants and, and ask for help if they want to ask a woman out or ask her to marry them. Um, so they were certainly reading the magazines, um, but I, I haven't seen anything. Um, I haven't seen anything uh, targeting directly targeting men. But that's not to say that men weren't using them. Okay. Um, the next question is from Katie. Um, what technological advances in printing did the pattern knitting pattern show? Did you colour photographs? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so definitely photographs. Um, I think, you know, before, so before the 
from before the 1920s, uh, it was usual for crochet patterns to be photographed. Um, I don't know if you saw, but they would they would make it in, in white, uh, white cotton and then have them against a black background. And it was usual for them to be photographed. And I think that's mostly because they're actually incredibly detailed and uh, the, 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 the image would be this great visual guide um, for uh, for the readers, you know, who were crocheting them. Um, and some of the patterns, uh, sorry, some some magazines also published uh, knitting patterns for, for, for sorry patterns for knitted lace for, for like tablecloth edgings as well so similar to the crochet patterns but knitted and often those would be photographed as well it was just the kind of the clothing which was much simpler which would appear as a drawing um, and so definitely I mean from the 1920s onwards yes um, you know photography becomes more uh, widely used in the magazines in general as well, not just on their knitting pages, but in general. Um, and I think, you know, these close ups that I was talking about, which sort of help you really appreciate the patterns construction. Um, I think they're made, they're made available as well um, by, uh, by, by, the, by advances in photography. Um, in terms of colour, um, it's, it's kind of difficult to gauge a lot, you know, the, the, the magazines like Women's Weekly didn't publish in colour until the 1960s. Um, so not all of the magazines um, were actually using colour technology, even though it was available. Um, most of the kind of interwar patterns that I've seen in colour tend to be, I think they've been coloured in afterwards. Um, they're quite blocky. They're not, it's not great quality. Um, and what's, what's, what what's more common is you'll see the the pattern in color on the front cover of the magazine um, where it's there to kind of attract your eyes um, but then inside the magazine it will appear in a nice photograph but that would be in black and white um but yes it's that you know you we are definitely seeing um seeing improvements um in in the magazine technology and the knitting patterns as well okay a uh, question from roxanne uh, here in the US, there was a pop very popular sweater style in the 1920s called a tuxedo sweater, open in the front, straight shawl collar, usually worn with a belt. Um, she's wondering, is there a similar style in the UK? Um, I haven't seen any of those in the, in the collection, anything that answers that description in the collection. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything that, but I definitely. I mean, there are definitely. I think I showed a couple of photos um, from the from the of the patterns from the twenties. You know, they did have they they did they did have belts a lot of them. So yeah, that part would definitely be similar. Um, a, a question from Stella: uh, Are there any actual garments still in existence in museums or collections? Uh, that's a great question, and yes, there are. Um, I can't think off the top of my head right now where they are. Um, I think the Knitting and Crochet Guild collection may even have some. And when I was working there, I was just looking at the patterns and they were also in the middle of moving from one site to another. So I didn't really get an opportunity to look at the, um, the, the knitted garments in as much detail as I'd like to. Um, but maybe someone, if there's anyone from the Guild here, um, maybe they could put that in the chat, whether we've got anything in the collection from the 20s and 30s. A question from Jan. Did designers get credit for their patterns or oh, their following? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, so in the domestic magazines, um, hardly ever, um, if they credited anyone for the pattern, um, it would be, they would say that it was designed by the knitting, um, by the knitting editor. So each of the magazines had their own kind of in-house editor who was probably in reality, like several people working on the knitting page themselves, but they'd sort of group together under this kind of identifiable personality, somebody like Dorcas or Leonie. Um, or Mrs. Arnold. I think actually Mrs. Arnold from Women's Weekly, I think she might have been a real person actually, but um, yeah, they'd have these, these sorts sort of knitting editors and these editors would kind of uh, present the patterns each week as something that they'd produced for the readers. And so they'd say, this week um, I'm presenting you with my beautiful jumper pattern. And so the assumption is that she, whoever she is, many people has made that pattern, um, but it was very, very rare um, for the pattern, for, for the um, for the designers to be named, but there is one example I can think of: this beautiful knitted wedding dress 
um, which appeared in, I think it was Women's Pictorial um, in the late 30s. And it's absolutely stunning. And its designer is named. And I'm now really realizing that I can't remember her name. But what I, I, what I do know is that when I Googled her, nothing came up. There's one piece, I've managed to find one piece designed by her in the V&A collection. And that's it. But the fact that the, the magazine kind of says, this is a, a this beautiful knitted wedding dress. It's by such and such a designer. The pattern is even um, introduced by a letter to readers from the designer herself <clears throat> saying, you know, this is my, my wedding dress. It was, you know, I, I hope you all enjoy wearing it. It was worn it hundred times at a recent fashion show. Um, and so it's clear that, um, it's clear that the, this, this designer, it, it, she's presented as someone who readers would be expected to know um, and would be expected to respect. And, and the, I think the idea is that you'd probably want to knit it because, um, you know, because she because she'd made it, uh, she designed it. So it's really annoying that I, I can't find out anything about her. I think this one is similar and you might have answered it really. Do you know, this is from Kirsty, do we know anything about the people who actually wrote the patterns? Are they always patterns? I think you might probably have answered that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Wow, very neat. Amazing. Yeah. Well, John, this was Marjorie Taylor Green coming up today, shall we say, with the four words that she knew. I think you've got your microphone on there we are thank you i think that's it really on the questions but i think you did fantastic coming through them at speed um, um that's really great you know I, th I think we're coming to the end now of our session and i think you wanted to share um, yeah. the pattern would you like to do that now yes. yeah let's do that now um let me just i just want to share my screen again because i have a slide i love slides here we are let's share this okay um yeah so um <clears throat> Yeah, so if we'd all been, I, I mean, I, I, I know I'm kind of assuming that like quite a lot of people here are knitters. Um, and if we'd all been able to get together in person, um, um, I would invite, I would have invited you to bring your uh, needles and uh, some yarns from your stashes and um, I'd have brought some patterns with me and we could have kind of tried them out together. Um, but sadly we can't do that. So um, what I've done um, is I've made a pattern booklet uh, using some of the patterns that um, I showed in my slides today. Um, it's available. Uh, it's available to download from Bitly. I've put the um, I've put the the link there on the slide, but I think uh, someone's going to put it in the chat as well. Um, and so this will kind of give you a little flavour um, of what some of these patterns are like to work with. Now, just to say. Um, as I said uh, earlier, um, the, the Knitting and Crochet uh, Guild patterns are um, reserved for, for Guild members. Um, and so uh, I can't publish the patterns in full um, in this booklet. Um, so what I've done is just taken some of the stitch patterns, some of the more interesting stitch patterns, for instance, the sort of camel frieze from the bottom of the uh, chic jumper in a new Egyptian design, for instance, and sort of put that in there. Um, so these patterns will give you a little kind of flavour of um, of what they were like to work with. Um, and if, um, if you'd like to knit anything from them that would be great if you'd like to share them that would be super I love seeing what people have done and hearing all about it and hearing what you liked about them and what you found a bit tricky and all of that kind of thing um so um be great if you could use the hashtag I think it's knit back 1920s um and if you could also tag at, at time and tide mag one um which is the twitter feed for the time and tide um project which is part of this uh, which is what you know this what this talk is part of and if you could tag that as well in your tweet um that'd be great and then I'll be able to find it and then retweet you um but yeah just use the stitch patterns to just be cre as creative as you like with them um you might just want to knit like a little blanket square uh, just use a couple of of repeats um, but you might want to turn it into a long scarf or like put it on a hat or on some gloves or just do whatever you like with it and I'll look forward to seeing. All right thank you very much Ellie. Um, we've got one last question. Um, Rachel